we, we survived the week, and uh, I survived the week. Thankful for that. <laughs> We're going to start a new study today on uh, morality, the idea of right and wrong, and so I'm going to introduce that in just a second. But uh, before we do, let's let's begin with prayer, and uh, let's. Uh, ask the Lord to bless our class time, and uh, we can also pray. I know we had, uh, there was a, we mentioned this in our prayer time this morning, but the shooting from this past week in San Diego, we want to uh, pray for those who were affected there, and the families affected, and that the Lord would, would comfort people and, and bring them to Himself, and we know that the Lord will bring peace on earth. Uh, the Bible talks about that, and that will come when Jesus returns. He's going to set all of these things straight. So let's, uh, let's begin with prayer, and we'll jump into our first lesson today. Lord, we thank you for your kindness to us and for allowing us to know you. Lord, we ask for your help today in all that's done and said this morning would be done and said to your glory and uh, Lord Jesus, that you would have preeminence in this church. Lord, I pray that you would bless our class time, uh, that you would honor your name and build up your body. Uh, we pray, Lord, for your comfort today for each person here, but also for conviction for each of us to know you better and to be even pricked in our conscience in areas that we've rejected your way. We pray, Lord, especially for those who are uh, mourning uh, or uh, just emotionally disturbed and troubled because of the, the shooting in the synagogue in San Diego this past uh, yesterday. Lord, that you would comfort them today, and Lord Jesus, that you as the Prince of Peace would, would be able to comfort them uh, with eternal comfort. And so we pray for your blessing on them and uh, all of these... Uh, uh, incidents like this, Lord, would be put to, put to rest, Lord Jesus, by you returning and uh, giving ultimate justice uh, to those who uh, mistreat and uh, destroy. And we ask for your blessing spiritually in that way. We know that Satan is the one who deceives and destroys and hurts so we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would triumph over his desires today in everyone's life, uh, in our own lives, and in the midst of this church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good. Well, hey, this is a class. So if you have a question or a comment, especially those related to the lesson, uh, but even if it's unrelated, that's okay. Uh, and... Uh, I, I would kind of appreciate that and enjoy that. But let me just give you a brief overview of where we're going with this. This is actually the first of five lessons. Uh, but we will probably take 10 class periods on it. We're not going to rush. If we don't get but halfway through this lesson today, that's okay. And the issue is, do you obey God? Right? How good is good enough? That's the question. And I just wanted to highlight where we're going with this. You all remember we passed this out not too long ago. I guess it was maybe a month or two ago as a map or an overview of where we're headed with this whole series or this whole curriculum of Bible studies. And if you remember, this first soil stage is the beginning stages of understanding what Christianity is and even receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, uh, because we're not born Christians, right? This is a decision uh, that people come to and make uh, based on the Spirit drawing and convicting and us responding in faith and repentance. And so we have a series of studies that help bring us to that point. And, and here are two of them that we've done already. Uh, one is, do you, do you know God? And this would be just a survey lesson of the gospel. 
uh, it's actually five lessons, but a survey of, of who God is. How has God made us? Who is Jesus? What is his plan for redemption? But then we have another booklet that, that uh, answers questions because some people say, well, what about this or what about that or what about the other thing? And everyone does. Everyone has questions. So this helps answer some of the questions of the, the Christian faith that people have brought up in the past, like the question of evil. Uh, why do bad things happen? Uh, the question of authority, right? Is the Bible truly the Word of God? Is it filled with errors? Uh, the question of origins, well, what about evolution and maybe scientific explanations for things? And then the question of history, right? Have bad things happened in history in the name of Christianity? Yes. Well, let's talk about that. Something may, maybe even bad has happened to you by someone who called themselves a Christian. And, and so we deal with that in that chapter. And then the question of tolerance and intolerance and the nature of truth. So that's that that's second booklet. And you'll see the third one here uh, is this idea of, do you obey God? Uh, you may have the questions answered and you may understand the gospel, but, but really not sense a need to commit to this. Um, and so that's what this study is about. Do, do we need this message of salvation? And so we're going to talk about this on several levels. Especially today, the lesson, What is Morality?, really deals with this on what we call an apologetic level. Um, and, and an apologetic level means there, the, there is uh, reasons given. Uh, not an apology, but the, the Greek word is, a, a, is the word apology. Uh, that says reasons. We need to be able to give reasons for the faith that lies within us. And so one of the, one primary reason to believe in God is this issue of morality. And so we're going to jump in this together and, and understand what God teaches. Uh, and really, even without looking in the Bible, you get a strong sense that there is a God, and I'm going to be held accountable for my actions, uh, without even opening the Bible we can come to those conclusions. Now, we are going to get in the Bible today, but, uh, but I think this lesson will, will help you, even as a Christian, to understand how to approach people who don't believe the Bible at all and help us realize that the, the way we're viewing the world, the Christian worldview, is reasonable. And it's a... It is... If you posit the other way, if, if you try to understand a world without God, then you come into some very bad, uh, dark rooms. And so we're going to discover some of those rooms today. Okay, so let me just introduce the subject here. What is morality? And, and we have a, you have the text in front of you. Uh, this is like the first draft, okay? And so this is how we do this. We teach through this, and then we put it into a little booklet to help uh, use it in the future. So when you find, I didn't say if you find, I said when you find points of grammar <laughs> or, or problems with spelling or say that's just a little awkward, just let me know. Put a little note there and I'll change it. So what is morality? I was shocked the first time, well, maybe take times, take turns reading this. I'll, I'll begin reading, but if you feel like reading too, follow along and, and you can read as well. Uh, I was shocked the first time I saw a subway sign that said that it was illegal to ride on the outside of the subway car. That option had never occurred to me. Okay, I can see why someone might ride in between the cars. At times, the insides of the cars can smell so bad that you'd rather risk an in-between-the-train car ride. So, someone might ride in between two cars, right? And you see people do that for a stop or two, which, which is illegal as well. But who is going to ride on the outside of the car, right? That is crazy. Or is it all that crazy? I started looking at the little metal lip on the top of the door it was very much like a handle. And the ledge on the floorboard outside of the car is fairly wide in order to get, in order to make up the gap between the car and the platform. I could probably stand on the metal ledge pretty safely 
and keep my balance by grabbing onto the ledge at the top of the door? Would there be enough space between someone and the wall as the train sped along from one stop to the next? I started doing the math. What I had never even considered became a temptation once I saw the command not to do it. And so I tried it. It wasn't that difficult. It wasn't all that dangerous. It was a bit of a rush, actually. And at rush hour, who wants to be stuck in the middle of a bunch of strangers? Okay, I didn't really try it. <laughs> but what did you think about that last paragraph? Did you think it was wrong for me to attempt a ride on the outside of the subway car? Who would say, Tim, that is wrong for you to do? Okay, I think we got most hands up. Uh, you probably made some judgment calls on my character. Why did you think I was wrong? Well, let's think of a few ways that I may have been wrong. Tim, you shouldn't do that. Why? I'm really not hurting anyone, right? I'm not hurting anyone. Why is it wrong? Well, you might argue with me that a city has a right to make its own rules of what is best for those who live in it or just passing through their boundaries. I ought to obey the city laws. That's one reasoning. You might think that this is a negative example for an adult, especially an adult who is also a church leader, right? So that would be another reason not to ride on the outside of the subway. I ought to set a good example, especially for Asher, right? <laughs> Don't want you doing this. Uh, you might argue that it is not responsible behavior for someone who has a large family, I have five kids, uh, that are depending on weekly income, right? I should be responsible uh, for this. And all of those are excellent arguments and more than enough to keep me from the ledge. But it illustrates something that I think it's interesting. There are actions that we say are wrong and there are actions that we say are right. And, and in this lesson, we're just going to put that out there as a question of who? Who tells me what is right and what is wrong? Or who tells someone else what is right and what is wrong? So, um, before we get into that, let me just start with this other idea. Is morality relative? Is morality relative? Right? And so, you, hey, who's ever heard of the, the term relative morality? You heard of that? Okay, a few of you. Well, let's just think through that and, and let's uh, examine that a little bit. I wonder if anyone else would feel like reading. Yeah. It's, there's some similarity, but mora relative morality would go to the extreme end. So situational ethics means that some things change varying on your circumstances. And, and so like depending on what, you, what you're referring to, I can kind of understand that. Right? I can discipline my child. Uh, I don't want someone else disciplining my child. I think it's wrong for someone else to say, okay, Hannah, you're grounded for the next two weeks uh, because I'm the dad. Right, so that that's my authority, um, and so that that's situational, uh, but we would say that's maybe different than than what some would call situational ethics. The idea of of uh, morality being totally relative is that there is no objective truth; that it always is just based on conditions, and the conditions can completely change from one case to another, from one society to another. Good question. Oh, so I think you answered it. So you're basically asking this question for non-believers. Yes, and it's even good for us, for, for believers, to think through in in solidifying our faith and also in presenting the gospel. Uh, but yes, yes, uh, this would be what we're saying is there is virtue and there's morality. Why? And and it points to God. Uh, and and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. So let's keep going here. We have a few opening topics. Who would read that? Is morality relative? So you see that page one down to the middle of page two, where it says, who made the standard of right and wrong? All right, Dominic, thank you. Morality relative. Morality is a word that often carries, C-A-R-R-I-E-S. <laughs> thank you. Which is not relative. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
carries this concept of right and wrong, this internal thought. Some would say that morality is entirely relative. By relative, we mean that it is entirely flexible based on the circumstances involved. So, what is right for you today may not be right for someone else, and although uh, we realize there are differences of situations. We also know that this is hogwash. Someone might claim morality is relative and might say that, but they don't believe that. This would be an, ent an entirely secular way of looking at the world. The world I don't want to experience entirely. Entirely dangerous way to look at the world. The person who says morality is entirely relative usually changes their tune when you steal their wallet or beat up their child or take their identity to purchase land in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. The dangerous conclusion to this idea in the past is that relative morality often has meant that the right and wrong is relative to the one with authority. The one with power tells the others what to do, and the one with power dictates what the rules are. And yet, we know that there are overarching thoughts that we all know are not relative of right and wrong, no matter who you are. If morality is not relative, then where do we go from here? Who made this standard for right and wrong? In his book, The Reason for God, Keller gives an entire chapter to developing this idea. A secular view of the world that purports relative morality is a bleak and even hopeless world. And yet understanding morality in the scope of Christian theology is a reasonable conclusion. If you believe human rights are a ra reality, then it makes much more sense that God exists than that he does not. If you insist on a secular view of the world, and yet you continue to pronounce some things right and some things wrong, then I hope you see the deep disharmony between the world and your intellect as devised and the real world and God that your heart knows exists. This leads us to a crucial question. If a premise, such as there is no God, leads to a conclusion you know isn't true, then why not change the premise? The other option is to recognize that you do know there is a God and could accept the fact that you live as if beauty and love have meaning, as if there is meaning in life, and if human beings have inherent dignity, all because you know God exists. It is dishonest to live as if he is there and yet fail to acknowledge the one who has given you all these gifts. So let's pursue that conclusion by answering the question, who made morality? Okay, so we're just setting aside for now the idea that morality is completely relative. I, I think most folks don't go that far, except maybe in higher academic circles, <laughs> uh, for people in their 20s in higher academic circles. Uh, but, uh, but, but most people believe, okay, yeah, you don't think that, that morality is relative, uh, where well, you can until I come to you with a hot a picture, picture of hot boiling water uh, over your head, and I can say, okay, is morality relative? Yeah, there's no right and wrong. <laughs> it, no, they don't want to hear there's no right and wrong when they're being mistreated. We realize that there are principles that we would say, well, that's definitely wrong, and that's definitely right. Uh, I would say this is a good, there's a good chapter in, in this book, uh, The Reason for God, that, that this uh, chapter 9 is devoted to this subject, and it's, it is very helpful. But uh, Keller's main idea here is dealing with, uh, with morality as opposed to evolutionary morality. And uh, so he just kind of handles that primary idea. Uh, which is, I, I think, very helpful. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. Who made the standard of right and wrong? Uh, one of the most difficult words to hear in any language is no. Uh, did you just say I couldn't do that? Well, you got a surprise coming, buddy. 
You can sense some of that in my subway story above. I wanted to do it when I was told not to do it. Uh, we all have this in us. You don't like the word no. Uh, you don't like the word no either, do you? Uh, perhaps you are even thinking automatically, yes, I do like the word no. Uh, because you don't like me saying that you don't like the word no. Um, which proves my point. Uh, some feel more threatened by others by this rule of no. Simply put, some authority is over you and dictates much of what you can do. Right? Perhaps your personality or perhaps your bad experiences have left you disliking authority more than others. Um, and uh, so depending on who the, the authority is, uh, you may have been mistreated by this person saying yes or no to you. And so anyone now saying yes or no to you, you reject. Or even just your personality, um, the way you're raised, right? You're, you're uh, just a libertarian at heart. And, and it's like, don't tell me anything what to, what to do. I'll uh, go live by myself in 100 acres in, in uh, Texas and be fine on my own. So you can see that mindset. Uh, but in a city, we learn, right? Don't we? Uh, to live in an urban setting, you have to know the word no. Because so many people around you are needing to live in the same city. Right? So you can do this. You can't do this. You can do this. You can't do this. Right? I wanted to have a, a, a barbecue pit in our backyard. And they said no. They said no. Why? I mean, it's so nice to have a fire in your backyard. And, uh, and, you know, roast marshmallows and, but, uh, but then I understand, you know, I, that I know the people around me that some of them are drunk all the time, like all the time. I don't want him having a, a pit in his backyard, right? Because then his fire is going to spread to the house, to the house, to the house. So I understand. I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh, but you understand, like living in a city, we're told no all the time. But look at the next paragraph here. We are all left saying, though, I don't want to obey authorities that I'm not required to obey, right? I don't want to obey the tax rules of Germany and South Carolina and New York. I just want to obey what I have to obey, and that's it. Minimalist as far as obeying authority. Uh, I just want to adhere to the authority that I'm required to obey. Uh, this was uh, cute. This is little Morgan. Uh, you're not my mommy, and you're not the boss. She shouted those words emphatically several times to my wife. Uh, Sarah told my young cousin that she had to wash her hands and she refused to obey. Uh, she had pretty good reasoning, right? She obeyed her mom. Her mom was the authority and she didn't want anyone else to step into that authority structure. Uh, Sarah was Aunt Sarah, not mom. And for her four-year-old mind, there was no reciprocity between mommies. So, who should we obey? Uh, we, we have this idea of authority... This idea of a relative morality is wrong, so who should I obey? Um, I'm going to get to that uh, in just a minute. Uh, that that uh, what we should understand is that the Bible teaches us what is right and wrong from the Word of God. But before we do that, let's get to one other thought. Uh, special ought for special humans. I recently sat down and watched an amazing documentary with my kiddos that drove into the depths of the ocean. It was a beautiful realm of nature, right, filled with mystery, a world still waiting to be discovered in a large degree. But the beauty is not unmixed with violence. We gazed on the seals sliding around. I can't remember if it was the Arctic or Australia or where they were. But, but as they were sliding around, along came this great white shark. Uh, and with suspenseful and remarkable skill, the video team documented a bloody attack. We watched the chase, uh, we watched the two escaped, and then the one uh, that did not. The slow motion catch in the air as the shark bit into the baby seal. Uh, the seal had no chance, and yet we watched with awe, and the program was rated G. And then the worst, though, was the follow-up. The camera crew allowed the great white to escape. I'm sure that that shark is still swimming around with blood-stained teeth, continuing his or her murderous exploits. How can we as a society allow this to continue? With all the amazing programs we have to help protect the wildlife in the ocean, why don't we protect these seals from their predators? <clears throat> I'm going to continue this line of thinking one more step further. I've also visited the zoo with, with kiddos in, in New York City and watched humanity actually promote this on the seal level of the equation. 
I've watched seals swim around and clap or jump in keeping with their trainer. And the seal is rewarded by murder, eating another smaller living thing. Right? Those fish had no chance. Where do we get off sentencing one living thing to death and allowing one to go free? Right? How is this murder a reward for a seal? How can murder be documented on a television program for children, the great white with the seal? And how can murder be a reward, the seal with the fish? Right? How is this true for some living things, but punishable by death or imprisonment for, for humans? Right? Why is there this double standard? The question may sound a little silly to you, but they're the ones that we should not regulate to absurdity. Right? We can't believe that we're all mammals and that the only right is might. Survival of the fittest. So then where did this sense of right and wrong come from? Humans have an accepted standard of right and wrong. These concepts point to one lawgiver that has given special principles to humans. And I propose, propose that this is a special group of rules that are given from our Maker. Uh, this understanding of a right and wrong actually points to the fact that there was a special authority that gave a special set of rules to humans. And that's what this whole booklet is about, is looking into those rules. But in the first lesson, we're just looking at the concept of rules and authority. And where did this all come from? Um, okay, so let's get to the, the uh, reasoning behind this. Those were all just introductory thoughts to get us to this point where we can set down now three steps of, I wouldn't call this a syllogism, but I would call it uh, three reasonable conclusions to come to, to bring us to, the, to Christianity's view of God and the Bible. So, look there at the top of page four. We have a special architect of the aughts. A special architect of the aughts. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay. Some good thoughts. These are, these are good thoughts for you to have. To, to, to understand that there is a reasonable, a reasonable explanation for Christianity. That, that Christianity is not a leap of faith in the dark. It is faith, but it is a reasonable faith. And, and not believing in Christianity takes more faith than believing in Christianity, is what I would say. So that's where we're going to with this first lesson. Okay, so this special set of do's and don'ts, of oughts, this special sense of duty, and the feeling of guilt when not fulfilling the duty, points to an architect, or an originator for the oughts. A law points to a lawgiver. And I'm going to say perhaps prove is too strong, but a sense of ought, a sense of morality, points to the existence of God. And so the reasoning goes like this. Okay, so we have these three points we're going to look at. And again, if we don't get through them all today, that's okay. Number one, humans are born with an innate sense of right and wrong. And so that's mainly what I've been talking about so far. Humans, not necessarily animals, right? We don't put monkeys on trial. And, and we think it's cute when monkeys throw stuff at us, right? And, and so people say, well, monkeys and humans, right? Same, you know. We, we think it's cute when monkeys throw stuff at us from the cage. If humans throw stuff at you, you call the police, and it's called assault, right? And, and we take care of that, making sure that this person's not throwing stuff at anyone else. And it's just, it's so clear. So humans, and I'm saying we're born with this, and we'll look at the Bible that, that shares this as well, are born with an eight sense of right and wrong. Number two, this concept of right and wrong assumes then a backup standard, a, a, a fixed standard of what is right and wrong, and this overarching, uh, what we would say, fixed objective standard for right and wrong assumes a person who set that standard, and we would say that is God. So let's look at each one of these. Number one, humans are born with an innate sense of right and wrong. I don't think you can argue with me on this point. I know above that sharks don't have this, but humans have consistently agreed on this. Okay, so let me just deal with one of the arguments. Uh, the sense of, one might argue, the sense of right and wrong. 
but the right and wrong does vary from one culture to another. Actually, this is an argument that assumes my point. Societies, all societies, have found some behavior that is moral and ethical and some behavior that is not. There is a right and wrong in every culture. And very often those cultures' assessments of what is right and wrong agree more than disagree. And we're going to deal with that a little bit more in just a second. But let's look at the Bible here. I think this is helpful, the Bible's explanation of this. Um, okay, we do not find a culture that encourages the little ones in nursery to deceive, steal, and harm the other little children in the nursery, right? Oh, your kid is being too, too kind in the nursery. Like, he's sharing his toys. Okay, that's not going to help him long term. You've got to teach him how to steal. He's got to stop sharing. You never hear that. We always have to teach the other way around. Always. And so, so, so there's this, this little problem in the child that needs to be fixed, but we're also recognizing that he's doing wrong, even from childhood. Children are taught to share and to be kind. Okay, so let's look at what the Bible's description of this from Romans, 12, Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, and we would say that's the law of Moses it's talking about there in the context, are a law to themselves, and that they show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So in the context, in the surrounding verses, Paul is teaching that we're all guilty. We're all guilty of breaking God's law, God's ideal sense of right and wrong. Whether you're Jewish or you're Gentile is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1. He's talking about Gentiles. And then chapter 2, he gets into Jewish people. And he's saying both Jewish people and Gentile people, of course, Paul is Jewish, uh, are all lawbreakers. And you might say, well, what about these Gentiles? They don't have the law of Moses. And, and he's going to say, no, but they do, in that it's written in their hearts. This sense of right and wrong actually comes from principles that are written on our insides. The phrase used, written on our hearts. All right, so let's look at a little more carefully at the, the verse in this next paragraph. It teaches that there is a voice inside us that reads those principles written on our hearts out loud. And what was that? Our conscience. Right? When the Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively do the things in the law, even though they don't have the law of Moses, they, they are writing a law to themselves because it's showing that the works of the law is written in their hearts. And then their conscience comes up and reads that law that's written in the heart. And says, I should not have taken that. I should have not have pushed that person just because they're smaller than me. And of course, that's when you're young. Uh, works are all written in their hearts. Their conscience then comes and actually brings that as a law to their mind. But then look what it says. That's not where it stops. There is a conscience. I'm sorry. There is a law in our heart. The conscience is this. Uh, actually is, is the law itself that brings it forward um, as a prosecuting attorney. And then these thoughts run like a defense attorney and a judge, right? And so you have the conscience inside of you that's giving the law like a prosecuting attorney saying, Tim, just X, Y, Z. Let's say Tim just stole a candy bar from the store. And, and so, Tim, just X, Y, Z, and, and there's something inside of me, even if I've never read the Bible, it says, you should not have done that. You're taking advantage of the store owner. You're taking something that's not yours. And so, something inside me is saying that. That is the law written on my heart. It's the prosecuting attorney. But it goes beyond that. It's saying that then your thoughts step in, and your thoughts are either going to accuse you as the judge and agree with the law written in our hearts and our conscience, or they're going to defend you. And so you're going to have a defense attorney in your thoughts too saying, yeah, but they're not going to notice anything. And that store owner is so wealthy. Who, you know, it, I'm doing a service to, to <laughs> stick it to big business. <laughs> a small business owner. No. Um, right, so there's these thoughts in my mind that are going to start to prod against the other way. 
and fight against this judge in my heart that is my conscience. And so that's what we have inside of us uh, each day uh, as the law is written in our hearts. So you see there on the, on the top, inner law uh, that's written on our hearts. And then our conscience comes and shares that inner law. And then there's thoughts that either reason to defend myself or reason to accuse myself. I wonder if anyone would want to share a time when this happened to you. You're like, you know what, I remember, and let's maybe go back to our childhood. Uh, so you're not like, yeah, yesterday I punched somebody in the subway. N not something like that, but maybe a little bit. How about the first time you remember this happening? Anybody remember the first time you remember your, your conscience yelling at you saying, you should not have done that? Anybody remember something like that? That you're willing to share? <laughs> well, I once lied to my parents about my conscience. You know, and your conscience pricked you? Yeah. yeah, so there's this inner sense of, I should not have done that. Whereas, like if we just were mammals, it's like, you got away with it. It's awesome. Like, I can lie and get away with it, right? But then there's this conscience that says, no, even if you get away with it, that was wrong to do that to your parents, right? To, to, to stretch the truth. Good. Anything else? Any other confession? It's good for the soul. With my brothers, I used to enjoy putting... Uh things on my pets, like socks on their feet or or a cup over their head and watching them walk backwards and bump into walls. I enjoyed it, enjoyed it, and when my conscience started bothering me, I still enjoyed it, but then I came to a point where I stopped. No, okay. I don't like anybody doing that, but yeah. I still enjoyed it for many years when I was a little girl, oh, okay. a teenager. Were you putting the sock on your brother's head? Or the animal's head? No, socks on their feet and, oh, and, okay. and, and a cup, like the cup. Oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. Head, and they walk backwards and they think that feels so bad. Okay. And I enjoyed it, but it Right, was so bad. right. But then you're like, your conscience is saying, but you shouldn't mistreat. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but it was years later. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's just interesting. There's this innate sense of ought that everyone has. Now, some would say that, that there are certain psychopaths that don't have this at all. And, and so we could debate that. And so that's why I say most. <laughs> but, but perhaps there, there are some folks who say they were never born with a conscience and they can do whatever they want and they, they feel no ill will at all. But as a child, they probably had some of this. And, and the Bible talks about our conscience being what? Anybody remember a, a word? Seared. Seared. That, that we just ignore it so much that we don't feel it anymore. We don't hear it anymore because we've, we've burnt it away. We've burnt the sensitivity to that principle away. And so I'm able to do it without thinking. Oh boy. Okay, let's, let's try to be done in the next eight minutes. Any other thoughts or comments before we move on to number two? I know we won't be able to finish this second one, but... I have a question, but it might complicate this, so maybe I'll save it for next week. Because it's a question about absolute morality and... Um, people stretching it. Okay. You know, like okay, so maybe write that down, and if it doesn't come up next week, make sure we deal with it. Okay, thank you, Diana. Okay, so, so the first one is this concept of right and wrong assumes a standard of right and wrong, and this is what the Bible calls our conscience written on our hearts, the law of God written on our hearts that our conscience deals with. And we, we could go into that because your conscience can be mistrained and, and poorly trained. That's not reflecting the law of God. You know, it's speaking out of turn, but we're not going to go down that road. Uh, now, number two, a higher standard of right and wrong, a higher standard of right and wrong assumes a person who has set that standard. All right, that there are rules for right and wrong that transcend all societies, but are only shared by humans, points to the idea of a higher law. And a higher law points to a higher lawgiver. His is a standard that rises above all cultures. Whose culture and existence transcends all cultures? Well, that's God's. I am so sorry. I completely skipped the second point. I was like, why am I already on there? Uh, number two, then, this, uh, the very top of page five. This concept of right and wrong assumes a standard of right and wrong. So we're just to that point. Um, if we can all agree that there is a standard of right and wrong that is inside most humans, 
In theory, you would say, well, they're psychopaths, they don't have it. Well, most humans, we would say, it is not much of a jump to get to the idea that there is an overarching standard of right and wrong that supersedes every culture. Uh, you may think the idea of right and wrong is only a cultural construct. And so C.S. Lewis helps us with this in his uh, book, Mere Christianity, with two main points. And I will highlight this as well. This is a great book. Um, oh, I think I have it here as well. Uh, Mere Christianity. The, he actually uses this as a primary point and a primary apologia reason for the existence of God. C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. And, and you know why he's saying this. He's actually writing this to a war-torn England, Europe, as bombs are being uh, leveled and people are really uh, struggling with World War II, with the, the rise of Nazism, this, this uh, morality that, that is exterminating people. And, and just the ugliest side, we would say, of naturalistic evolution. Uh, that, that, you know, here's people and they're not, they're not lending to the survival of the fittest, so they're going to do away with them. That is Hitler's thinking. And, uh, and so, as, as, as bombs are falling, they asked C.S. Lewis to give a series of radio addresses uh, showing why it's reasonable to believe in God. And so his first part, and these are the first five chapters of this book, deal with that. And in book one, the first five chapters, right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe. So he really deals with this a lot better than I ever could. And so I, 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 I recommend it highly to you. Um, but he, you know, he is going to give us some helpful arguments against this idea that, that morality is entirely a cultural construct. Well, this society has this cultural morality, and this society has this cultural morality, but there's no overarching morality from God. Let's look at these two points, and we'll maybe spend some more time with it next week. But the first is this. Though there are differences between the moral ideas of one time or country and those of another, the differences are not really very great. Not nearly so great as most people imagine. And you can recognize the same law running through them all. Whereas mere conventions, like the rule of the road or the kind of clothes people wear, may differ to any extent. And he actually does a study on this, uh, recognizing and kind of categorizing morality of all these ancient cultures, ancient Chinese culture, and uh, many different cultures. Egyptian, he examines the the uh, the comparison of them, and it's not a huge difference, right? You can go back to the Ham Hammurabi's code. I think we deal with that in my other booklet, right? And, and just see the the amazing significances between all these different cultures to these aspects of real morality. And we're saying that's because it's written on our heart. The other reason is this: uh, when you think about these differences between the morality of one people and another, do you think that the morality of one people is better or worse than the other? And of course, that's what they're dealing with there. I mean, here is a, a country, or a Germany at that point, is saying some, uh, coming to some horrible conclusions with, with the, within morality. And, and so he would say their idea of morality is definitely better than that one. Have any of the changes been improvements? If not, then of course there could never be any moral progress. Progress means not just changing, but changing for the better. And so if no set of moral ideas were truer or better than any other, there would be no sense in preferring civilized morality to savage morality or Christian morality to Nazi morality. So you see where he's coming from here. Uh, the, you, know, you can't say that morality is just cultural because you're going to compare two cultures and if they're very similar, you're going to say that morality is a better morality. Right? That there is a better system of morals in that culture and, and that is pre, pre, presuming, that's supposing that there is an overarching view that would be over all cultures and all societies of all time periods. Um, so our last paragraph there, some cultural laws are more acceptable than others. These laws are more in tune with the highest law. The view of a higher law, a higher standard, 
If you believe in a higher standard that supersedes all cultures, then you see how this naturally leads to the view of a person that is behind this highest standard, a creator God. Okay, so we better be done for today. And uh, we just have two other quick thoughts to deal with next week before closing that chapter out. We'll do some questions. But, but any thoughts or, or comments from class? You guys stayed awake. That's good. I know this is, this is more of an academic idea, but it's an important one. It's one to have under our belts when we're thinking through the existence of God and, and that God is real. The only thought I have is that when you go back to the 1930s in Nazi Germany, and when you have bad people, that was the minority of the, of the entire country that was doing all the damage, then don't the good people of Germany should have the morality to try to stop the bad people like mm -hmm. Hitler and try to destroy them before it affected the entire country and started World War II, if we would have had that, maybe World War II would not have happened in the first place. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a important question, a searching question. I I know that we you did have people, uh, of course, who ran against him, but also when he came into power, people that tried to kill him. All right, one of uh, my favorite, bi not my one of my favorite, but a good biography that I just enjoyed uh, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, pastor, martyr, spy. And he was actually part of an underground, he came to Harlem when the war started and maybe even was born again there in a church. But then he's like, how can I let Germany, he, he was born in Germany, how can I let Germany continue? This? He went back to Germany and started it, was part of an underground resistance. And they actually got to the point where they had a bomb placed in Hitler's room under a desk where he was sitting, and it went off. And uh, they did not kill him, but they tried. And uh, so there were people who tried. Well, that was in 1944, but I meant in the 1930s before he, be before he got to power. Yeah. When, when the Nazi party in the very beginning, when, you know, in other words, I was just saying that a lot of the German, what I was reading, a lot of the German people looked the other way. They knew bad mm. things were going on. Yeah. And they did. They I think did, that's a and, good and they didn't try judgment. To stop it. You see what I mean? Yeah, it's a judgment for human, uh, you know, we, we can never allow uh, even a, a leader right to blindly follow any leader and uh and you had this rising sense of of uh nationalism that became a very bad thing and uh well so i think it kind of plays to your first point that you're talking about relative morality <laughs> you know if you look through history you know at that time when hitler took power there was mass poverty in germany i mean they had like hyperinflation where their money was basically useless like you needed like 14 billion marks equaled like one us dollar or something so it's like when when there's extreme poverty and extreme um you know your socioeconomic climate was just basement but then hitler gets into power and things seemingly start to get better for the german people all of a sudden that relative morality becomes a little mm. bit more gray and people kind of start to think you know maybe this isn't right but am I better off now than I was three hmm. or four years ago? You tend to let things kind of slide. So I think it kind of proves your point that okay. people kind of are okay with letting, you know, ignoring that moral conscience when it seems to be benefiting your direct hmm. social status or economic state or things of that nature. If the circumstances are okay, they're, so that people do get, get lulled to sleep by by pleasant circumstances and, and I think we see that even in our own country if if we see some big things that that are just horrendously wrong uh, according to Bible morality and and yet you know we're just like uh oh, yeah this is a this is this is just whatever we've had it since the 70s or no but but this is murder right abortion is murder and and it's always murder and uh and so you have uh well let's you know i anyway um we're out of time but but you can see how societies just just uh start to accept the unconscionable 
Now, I would say it seems as if they covered a lot of this up to where the, the general public did not know what was going on completely. Uh, but the ones in power did. And, and I would say this, it's, it's interesting that this, those who were doing the worst deeds knew it was wrong. Even with all the propaganda um, in, uh, I think actually in, in Keller's book here, he mentions, no, 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 this is in, a, in uh, another good apologetic, but uh, I'm not going to be able to quote who it's from. But he, he mentions that, that there, there, there was a philosopher, uh, a Jewish philosopher, who went through the concentration camps, and, and one of the German soldiers begged him to forgive him. And, and he was left with this ethical dilemma in his own mind, because he's like, I don't want him to feel forgiven. He needs to to be tortured by this. And also to be fair to the German people, I want to be fair to them also. In the 1930s, Hitler was killing all his opposition. He was slaughtering them, killing them. He was yeah. ruling yeah. from fear, and people were afraid of their lives. I speak up, they're going to kill me. Yeah. So it, it was a very tough time, you know, yeah. to, mm. to try to stop him. You know? mm. Okay, well, we, we better be through here. Just some very deep topics we're, good, we're just kind of touching on. But, but let's, let's return to the big idea of, of the you know, morality, the, the idea of ought, really, really starts to suppose or presuppose someone who gave that to me, who made me with that, and, and that I may actually be answerable to him. And that's where we're going with all of this. Am I obeying him if he made me with this and, and revealed his will? All right, let's, uh, let's close in, in prayer here. And, and we'll be through. Okay, who's going to close us? Bob, would you close us in prayer? Thank you, brother. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for uh, this time that uh, stop this second. Morality and the kind of things we just want to uh, thank you, Lord, for challenging us uh, this morning in uh, some very um, heavy themes and principles. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we would approach the subject with the uh, utmost respect for the word and uh, really have a conviction that. Um, you called us into your family uh, and your kingdom uh, to be obedient and responsive to your voice. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, uh, for bringing this uh, subject to light. Uh, help us to understand the scriptures uh, and, uh, relative to the subject. Uh, we thank you for this day. We uh, ask your blessing upon the worship word of this day. Pray, Lord, that everything is uh, all that we need. Uh, all of our worship is pleasing to you. It brings honor and glory to you. We give thanks to this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. We are dismissed to uh, head up the hill here.